Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And I would like to start to thank uh, and the organizing committee for inviting me to this beautiful country, beautiful city, really enjoying. And I've heard uh, a lot of important stuff this morning, a lot of very important presentations. I think especially the presentation on HCG was very difficult for all of us, but maybe the most important presentation of today. So I would like to compliment the Dr. Cirela is the name, I think, with her presentation, which was a great presentation. Now I'm going to talk about surgery in the treatment of GTD. And uh, so I advance in the middle, I think. Yes, I do. So coming back to what do we need as doctors or as hospitals in order to treat our patients with gestational trophoblastic disease? Because we want to do a good job. We want to cure them. We want them to survive. These are young women. We don't want them to die. We need excellent pathology. And we heard in the previous presentations that pathology is important, but pathology is also difficult. You told us about pathology. It's not easy to make the right diagnosis. I think the pathologist is the cornerstone of the treatment of these patients. So I'm sorry for Matt and also Michael. Medical oncology is not the important part. Gynae oncology, which is my own profession, is also not the most important part. It's the pathologist that has to do the job. When we have a good diagnosis, we can try to manage and to cure the patient. If we have the wrong diagnosis, we will fail. We'll do the wrong thing. And the same holds true for the ACG assay. As you heard, ACG is not just one molecule. When we look at the blood of a patient with a trophoblastic tumor, there's a soup of all different types of HEG molecules that we would want to measure. So if we don't use the proper HCG assay in our hospital, we will make mistakes. If you switch from assay, let's say the patient is referred from one hospital to the other, you'd switch your assay, you may be making mistakes because you will not be reading the same HCG levels as you had before. And then at the bottom, the clinical management, we need a nice, good doctor to treat the patient. But this is not the most important part. So pathology in trophoblastic disease, and Matt already alluded a little bit on this. How often is initial pathology diagnosis correct? And this is a very important question. How often is it direct for complete mole, for partial mole, and for the malignancies we need to treat? Is there a need for centralized pathology in this modality? We have three studies in Europe, one from Belgium, one from the United Kingdom, and one from France. And you can see the numbers, the numbers of the patients that are in the studies. So this is a study where the diagnosis of the pathologist in the hospital was compared to the diagnosis of an expert pathologist, a reference pathologist. And when you look at confirmation of diagnosis, the first diagnosis was only correct in 70% of cases. So in 30%, the first diagnosis was a wrong diagnosis. Now, when we look at the different diagnoses there are, then a complete mole is not so difficult for a pathologist. Every pathologist is able to diagnose the complete mole. But when we look at the partial mole, we start to make mistakes. And when we put this together, then the mistakes are made in partial mole, in choriocarcinoma, and in PSTT. And these last two are extremely important. Because if you fail to have the proper, the correct diagnosis in these patients, you will be making a complete failed management. So the pathologist is the cornerstone of your treatment team. You need a good pathologist. And if you think you don't have the good pathologist in your hospital, you need to look for a reference pathologist, for somebody who is good enough, who is expert, who is good enough to make the diagnosis. Is there a need for reference or for centralized pathology? Yes, there is a need. And you can deduct that from the figures that I've just shown to you. Now, EOTTD, our European Organization for the Treatment of Trophobast Disease, together with ESCO, is trying to establish centers of 
expertise all over Europe. And we've been doing that for about 10 years now. And we have created centers of expertise in many of the countries in Europe. So these centers you can call, you can contact from your country to find out whether your diagnosis was correct, what chemo do you need to give, what do you need to do. So we hope that in the future, every country on this slide, and of course also Russia, has a number of centers of expertise. And I think looking at your population of 145 million inhabitants, you need about three to four centers of expertise in your country. So I would say, create them. Create your centers of expertise. You know where your pathologist is, the one that you can always call if you're in doubt, because I think that is very important. Now let's get back to the surgery because a gyne gynecologist wants to use his knife. We know that we want to operate. In every case, well, not in every case, but in most of the cases, it will start with surgery. It will be your evacuation, your curatage. And the curatage you do will have to be a suction curatage. Not a steel curatage, but a suction, cur a suction curatage. And you want to do that under ultrasound vision. You don't want to do it just blindly. It's better if you do it with an ultrasound on top. And don't use your oxytocin if you don't need it. Don't use it because we have an indication that you might spread the disease if you start your oxytocin too early in the treatment of a patient with a GTD. So after your evacuation, you start your ACG management in the patient and again, find out what assay your hospital is using. Try to get some information on the assay because, because not every assay is good enough. You don't just want to use your pregnancy assay because that is the wrong assay. You need a better one. So you start following your ACG after evacuation. And in my country, in the Netherlands, we use a normogram to follow the patient. So we know that every patient that has a proper normalization has to be in between these two curves. This is the P95 the P5, and this is a spontaneous normalization for this patient after evacuation. But in a number of patients, it doesn't go that way. They start to raise again. So this is when you make your diagnosis persistent trophoblastic disease, PTD. This is where a regular mole becomes a malignancy. A malignancy because the ACG starts to rise again. The trophoblast doesn't follow what we want the trophoblast to do. So when this HCG starts to rise again and we make the diagnosis malignancy, and in this case, uh, we might think, is a second curatage a way to treat this patient then? And there, there are five studies in literature at the moment that have looked at this second curatage in low-risk GTM. And the studies are different. Three of them are retrospective, two of them are prospective, and the last study, the study by Osborne, is probably the best study that we have at the moment. We're still discussing whether this study is perfect, but it's probably the best indication we have. And that study demonstrates to us that 40% of the patients can be cured with a second evacuation. Now maybe 40% is a little too high, I'm telling you we're discussing these figures, but. If it is 40%, then it is very worthwhile to do this second evacuation once your mole starts to persist again, starts to go up again. So in our country, we do do this second evacuation. We're very careful in doing it because in the last, last bar, you can see that there's a complication rate. Because when you do a curatage in a second session, there is a higher risk for perforation. We all know that. So. I insist on using an ultrasound, especially in those cases, because the perforation rate is quite high. It's, it's, it's close to 10% in these young women. And we don't want to end up losing the uterus in these young women because we had a perforation with the bleeding and all the problems. So beware of the complications, but know about the 40% cure rate while doing a second evacuation, a second curatage. I think it's worthwhile discussing it with your patient to do this, or at least to think about it. So this is 
not what we want to happen. This is a perforation. It's a perforation in the midline. Uh, we were lucky at that time. But we don't want this to happen because you'll have to operate you, and you may lose the uterus in this case. And in this case, the perforation, the perforation happened uh, on the lateral side. And you can see the spillage of the trophoblastic disease into the abdominal cavity. So we had localized disease in the uterus. Now we have disease spread all over the peritoneal cavity. This is not what we want to have. So beware of the complication rate of your second evacuation, your second curatage. Yes, there is a place for a second evacuation. Up to 40% cure rate. Beware of the higher risk for complications. We know that if you do your second evacuation, the chemotherapy you may need will be less. You'll, have, you'll need less courses after this second evacuation. So getting rid of the bulk of the tissue helps you in treating the patient. Properly counsel your patient. Make your patient aware of the risks that there are whenever you do this second evacuation. Hysterectomy. So this was a second curatage, but is there a place for a hysterectomy in a patient with a low risk GTN? So a mole that starts to progress again. Is there a place for a hysterectomy? Well, probably not in the young woman that wants to become pregnant again because she needs her, her uterus. But what about the older ones? And it's always you never you should never use the word old in women i learned as a gynecologist but when they're over 40 years of age and they already have five children maybe they would don't want to become pregnant again and then maybe he's doing a hysterectomy in case of low uh, low risk gtn is a good way to treat the disease so the french have studied this now in the past in the 1960s hysterectomy was the only thing the people at that time could do so they did a hysterectomy and they had a survival rate of 40%. And in, met in metastatic disease, of course, this was very low, this survival rate. These women all died, many of them, until methotrexate was developed or found, or however you would say. This is the 1970s. And methotrexates start to save patient lives. So this is when the switch from hysterectomy towards systemic treatment uh, was put in place. So methotrexate was a great help. Now the, the French group, as Matt already said, did a beautiful study in trying to find out, and this is a nationwide study in France, big country, trying to find out whether the hysterectomy has a role in the treatment of low-risk GTN. So again, a mole that starts to persist again. Hysterectomy is not the recommended treatment for low-risk GTN. We know that, especially in young patients, because they want to become pregnant. It may be mandatory in emergency situations. In, in, you know, in case of big bleeding, big time bleeding, you may need to do a hysterectomy, but that is a different situation. So they wanted to analyze the efficacy of primary hysterectomy. And again, this is a nationwide study. So they had 1,000 cases, the pointer doesn't work, 1,000 cases of uh, low-risk GTN, and they split them up because they really wanted the cases in which the hysterectomy was just done to cure the disease, not because of a bleeding, not because of an emergency, just to cure the disease. And at the end, they were left with 74 cases of low-risk GTN in which they did the hysterectomy. And as you can see, 61 of the 74 cases were cured with just doing the hysterectomy. So this is a success rate of 82.4%, which is quite high. If we use methotrexate in these cases, we usually don't obtain 82%. The success rate with methotrexate is lower. So doing hysterectomy gives you a better success rate. Still, you don't want to do this in the young woman. But think of it if you have that woman that is 43, 45, doesn't want to become pregnant again, maybe this is the way to go. So the take home message from the French study is primary hysterectomy was efficient in 82% of selected cases. It's an alternative choice for methotrexate because methotrexate could also have cured the patient and then without an operation. It does not eliminate the need for chemotherapy because 18% of the patient, even after hysterectomy, needed some type of chemotherapy to be cured. They were all cured. This is another 
message I think we need to bring, every woman with a low-risk GTN should be cured. That's what we think within our organization. And I think every country in the world would like to get there, that every, pay, every woman with a low-risk GTN is cured. Now, what about high-risk GTN? What about doing surgery in high-risk GTN? There is a reason to do surgery in high-risk GTN. Surgical resection of residual drug-resistant disease can save lives. So the surgeon can, in these patients, be the one to save the life once systemic treatment fails or can no longer uh, be given to the patient, then maybe a surgery can save her. 50% of patients with high-risk GTM will require some type of surgery. We know that from some of the papers. Hysterectomy and pulmonary resection are the most frequently used types of surgery in high-risk GTM. These are the reasons for adjuvant surgical procedures to remove resistant, persistent disease in the uterus or at metastatic sites. So if disease persists after your systemic treatment, then this may be the only option to remove it. To decrease the tumor burden in the uterus in patients with limited metastatic disease, we have a feeling that this could help the patients by getting rid, rid of the bulk in the uterus. You could be, it could be better at treating the metastatic sites systemically. Of course, control tumor hemorrhage and relieve bowel or urinary obstruction if that is indicated, and we need to do surgery for these patients. There's a big difference between doing surgery in PSTT, placental site of blasted tumor, or choriocarcinoma. In PSTT, surgery is probably the most important part of the treatment. So most patients with placental site of blasted tumor will have a hysterectomy and will be cured by having that hysterectomy. Whereas in choriocarcinoma, the first choice is always chemotherapy, is not a hysterectomy. In metastatic disease, the same holds true. The problem in PSTT is that this tumor is not that responsive to chemotherapy, so it will probably be a combination of hysterectomy and chemo. Whereas in choriocarcinoma, again, chemotherapy is your cornerstone and not the hysterectomy. So in localized residual disease, both are equal. If you've given your treatment and you did your utmost best to cure the patient, but there's still some disease left in the lung or maybe in the uterus, then a resection could be the ultimate way to cure this patient and to, to save her life. This is a patient with a vaginal metastasis of choriocarcinoma, and we see that uh, sometimes. Not as big as this one, and I've never seen them as big as this one, but they happen. The problem with choriocarcinoma is that it bleeds very easily, and it bleeds heavily. So you have to be very careful. You don't want to operate on this patient, because you'll be doing a big time operation, you'll be mutilating the patient, and she has a very good chance of responding to systemic treatment. The question is always that uh, doctors uh, are very keen on doing biopsies and then whenever they see something you want to biopsy it. Just starting to biopsy this will bring you in, can bring you in a huge problem because it will start to bleed. You will not be able to stop the bleeding and you may end up doing your big time surgery that you didn't want to do. So don't biopsy this, never touch it. If it starts to bleed, maybe embolization is the way to try to stop it. But again, don't start a surgery on a case like this. This is a patient with choriocarcinoma, residual disease after uh, systemic treatment. On the left side, with multiple loci, foci in the lungs. On the right side, probably with only one visible focus. So this, this patient on the right side would be the optimal patient to do surgery on this lung to get rid of this hopefully last bit of uh, tumor in the patient after all this systemic treatment. Can we talk into the mic because Sorry. it's really hard, hard time to hear you. I will talk into the microphone. So the, the patient on the left side is a much more difficult patient because you see these multiple metastatic sites and it is impossible to get rid of all these, uh, these 
foci in the lung. Now the problem with these remaining foci is often that we don't, we're not really sure whether they're all vital. So we have an indication from the ACG assay that there's still disease, active disease. Are they all active? Are they all vital? We don't know, maybe a PET scan could help us a little bit in that case, but the patient on the right side is an optimal patient to do the surgical approach. The patient on, on the left is very difficult and maybe at the end, if you don't have anything else you could do, you may try to get rid of some of these folks and then hope that the active disease is in, is in the ones that you take out. But this is going to be a very tough case. There's one nice paper by John Lorraine from Chicago, the, the Brewer Trophoblastic Center. I think a very good and important center in the world. They've been doing a, a lot of great work and they presented 50 patients with high-risk GTN treated with MACO, as we all do most of the times. And in 24 patients, they had 28 surgical procedures. And as you can see, most of the procedures are hysterectomies. Then comes the lung resection, as I said in the beginning. Then a uterine wedge resection, a small bowel resection, suturing liver or uterine bleedings, and an embolization. So 28 surgeries in 24 out of 50 patients. So again, about 50% of our patients need some type of surgery to be cured at the end. And 21 out of the 24 survived, were cured, which I think is a, is a very good, a very good figure in these patients. So in conclusion, low-risk GTN can all be cured. I think this is very important. This is what we want to reach. 100% of these patients should be cured. A second curatage may be helpful, but beware of the complication rate and, and discuss this with your patient. Hysterectomy in case of low-risk GTN is an alternative choice to MTX, to methotrexate, for patients who do not want to maintain their fertility when they're young. This is not an indication. Hysterectomy is the primary choice in PSTT, placental cytoplastic tumor. But chemo is the primary choice in choriocarcinoma and not uh, a surgery. Always think of surgery as the only ultimate possible cure in GTN. Thank you.